So I like gained the respect of everybody in the gym. Everybody started to love me. And after that month, my mom was like, you know, I'm not going to help you anymore. Like, there's really, there's no need for me to help you. You need to figure your life out. And I really think you should go back to school. I think you should give up on this whole CrossFit thing. So man, I had a lot to think about. And I think what really started to happen was I just was running out of money and I didn't know what to do anymore. So I had to come to grips with my friends and tell them like, hey, I don't have any money and I might have to drive all the way home to New Jersey to my mom's house, go back to school and do something I potentially don't even want to do. So there was this girl, she's like, you know what? You can sleep on my couch if you want for as long as you need to get on your feet. And But I had never talked to this girl in my life. And I originally turned it down and then got to the point where I had to move all my stuff out of my house that I was living in and I sold all my stuff and I had slept in my car for like a week. And I was like, I can't do this. This doesn't right, you know? So during that week, actually, is when I started to steal. I started stealing uh, like food and groceries and stuff from the grocery store because I wanted to stay and I didn't have any money. Ryan Fisher in the building. How are you, man? <laughs> Super excited. It's been it's been a long time coming. <laughs> it's been a very long time coming. I mean, you've missed each other like three different times, time zone problems, but I've got you, I've locked you down. How's the bicep? How's the injury? Oh, well, actually, that is coming along. I have like maybe three more weeks until I can kind of cut loose. But right now it's been, whew, it's been one hell of an experience. I've never had to stay so diligent about something for so long. Like I've, I've literally had to like do nothing for two months. And then after that, it's been very, very light weights for the last like month. And I'm just like dying to get after it again. But <laughs> yeah, I think it was, I think it's been good for me though. Cause I've been, I've been getting after it for such a long time that to have a little bit of a break is probably good. You're probably giving other bits of your body a rest as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I've had a little bit of an injury as well. And one thing that was a question that's come through in my mind was what, who are you without your fitness? You know, without that, endorphin kick every single day it's like being on a drug for all your life and someone taking it away for me it was more like my whole life is fitness in terms of like my business and like things that I sell and everything and like I feel like me looking good is part of all of that and just like it kind of gave me a little bit of stress and anxiety and then I was like oh wait a second like all the stuff that you've made you you've already made <laughs> you don't like need to currently look amazing in this exact moment. And then like, there's other things that you want to do that have nothing to do with that. And I've spent this entire time kind of focusing on those things. And I don't think I would have gotten as far into some of these other projects that I have if it wasn't for the injury. It's a good way to kind of force fitness out of your life for a little bit and give you, give you time to focus on other stuff. Right. Yeah, for sure. Cool, man. So first off, how, how do you describe what you do? Someone says, hey, hey, friend, I've met you at, a, at a, <laughs> an event. What do you, so tell me who you are. What do you do? That's funny because I get that question a lot because everybody knows that I do a lot of things. So I'm always like, shit, <laughs> I guess I'll tell, I guess I tell everybody that, I guess the short part would say I'm a fitness entrepreneur, but usually I say I own a bunch of fitness companies and I own a social media agency. That's usually what I say. So I do have books that I sell that do very, very well. So there's like, there's probably like almost 10 different books that I sell like daily. And then I have my earn your carbs challenge, which is, it used to be the carb cycle challenge and then the keto cycle challenge. And now I'm just turning it all into just the earn your carbs challenge and you get to pick which way you want to go. So if you like high fat diets, then keto cycle is the way to go. If you like high carbs then keto or the carb cycle is the way to go. And you just pick it and I get these people in a group on Facebook, we do live Q and A's together. They get all this information. I've created a website that you put in your daily energy expenditure and all the numbers and stuff pop up. It's custom to, to me. And then they get books and workouts and all sorts of stuff. And it's, it's, this, it's this big thing that I just did for fun for my gym. And I would post them on social media on my CrossFit Chalk Instagram because that was my first gym was my CrossFit gym. And People were like, I want to do this challenge. It looks really good. And I was like, all right, well, why don't you Venmo me or PayPal me? And then all of a sudden, like all these people were Venmoing and PayPaling me and I was, I couldn't keep up with it. I started to, I'd be sitting home on my phone and I'd be like, oh my God, well this person, and I have to let him into the group. And before I knew it, I'd be on my phone all day for like 2000 bucks for the month or something. And I'd be like, man, I, there's gotta be a better way to do this. So eventually I started to figure out a better way to do that. And now the challenge is it's a little bit easier to purchase and a little bit easier to manage. Mm. But as I got better at that, I realized that there was a better way to sell your products as well. And I got into like social media kind of marketing. 
And then from there, um, I just created the marketing agency that kind of helped me in the beginning. I had all those people quit their job and then we kind of just did it for other people. Yeah. <laughs> so now a lot of my really good friends who are like kind of big in the fitness industry, I run all their ads for them and I just take a percentage of that of the sales so that everybody seems to want to work really, really hard to get that person to make money. So in short, <laughs> a lot. I, cre- <laughs> I created that agency basically to help other people. Uh, and then I have my stuff that's all helping at the same time. And then I run my gym. I, I run my, I, I live here in Orange County, California, and I run my gym every day. And yeah. I run the Instagram. I run the Instagrams <laughs> for both. Is that and still you? That you haven't outsourced the Instagram to anyone else? Nope. Wow. It's, you know, you get to your sort of, size of of kind of workload and sometimes you've got the the social media assistant you dictate across the room they put the post up or whatever i have i have someone who does like stories for it crossfit chalk and then they'll answer some of the dms but i always make the post that's an interesting takeaway for gym owners there'll be a lot of gym owners listening a lot of athletes listening people who maybe have aspirations to own their own facility eventually and um it's interesting that you've you've held on to that the sense of connection between you and marketing. So with, with the posts for the gym, they're so important to me because what you say is going to resonate with somebody on some level. You might say something like sometimes I'll talk about like why we do hip thrusts. And I don't think that my person that works the desk can, you know, really talk about hip thrust in like a, in a way that makes people want to do hip thrust. (laughs) I don't think anyone and, can talk about hip thrusts in a way that makes <laughs> anyone want to do hip thrusts. That's single, like split squats, man. No one wants to do split squats. Yeah. But then I'll also write like, well, hey, like if you, you know, do you follow CrossFit? Do you follow Chalk Online Programming or whatever? If you don't, then, you know, blah, 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 blah. And like, I don't think anyone's going to want to take, you know, pride and initiative into saying these little things that kind of hook people in. Mm-hmm. So I always do the post. And there's definitely days that go by where I'm just like, I'm so fried on my own Instagram that I just don't even do a post. It happens for sure. I don't think I made one yesterday. My own Instagram is a beast. So it's like, I'll answer at least a hundred DMs a day. I have, I always do a post no matter what. I always do my stories. No one's ever answered a DM in my, in my Instagram. Mm. I mean, that's how we connected, right? You know, I'm hustling you slide into the DMs and we finally get the date right for this. So yeah, I've got a I got a friend George McGill who talks about that. He says the barbell strategy for certain things like all in or all out for a lot of things. Get the people that do the stuff that you're bad at to take that over and then continue to double down. Um so yeah, I, what I want to do, I want to get I want to have the definitive guide to Ryan Fisher's life, right? I want yeah. anyone that follows you online and for the people who don't, you have an interesting very interesting background. Um, and you hear these stories on your Insta or social media or whatever, little separate bits, little chunks. And that obviously sort of ties people in, but I want to hear, I want the full Monty, right? I want start to finish. Tell us how we, tell us how we get to you being sat here in front of me in Orange County. How, where do you want to start? Let's start at childhood, man. Where are you from? Oh shit. All right, cool. Um, this might take a while by the way for your listeners, but but, but I'm good for it. So childhood, I lived in Tom's River, New Jersey. It's a little beach town central part of New Jersey, all the way in the East Coast. It's obviously a lot farther away than I am right now. And as I grew up, I, well, this is actually part of the story is I, I always felt like there was something wrong with me in my family. I, I I grew up in a big family. I had, you know, I have, I have five brothers and sisters that I'd lived with in a house, but then I have three other sisters from my dad's side. None of us have the same two parents at any point. I didn't know that like realistically until I was like 18. And then I found out who my dad was when I was 18. And then I met him when I was 24. And and when I actually met him, it made a lot of things in my life, you know, make me understand a lot of things. Like I I, I genuinely as a kid was like, I don't get it. I, I don't know why I'm here. Like I would feel like I'd wake up in the wrong family every single day. Black sheep. It was such a strange feeling and it took until I was 24 to figure out why I felt that way. And basically as I grew up, I was always just like a fucking madman. Like I wanted to, I, my mom bought me a bike one year for Christmas and I just never put it down. Like I would ride everywhere. Like I remember getting like flat tires on my bike and having to call my mom. And I, at the time I had this giant monstrosity of a phone and it was like, (laughs) it was, it was a prepaid phone. And I had like 10 minutes on it and I'd call my mom 
And I'd be like, hey, I'm all the way out here. I need you to pick me up. I got a flat tire. And she'd be like, that's like a 35 minute car ride, which like on a, on a 20 bike miles be, or something on a bike would be like, you know, super far. <laughs> and then um, she'd come get me and be like, what is wrong with you? Like you're 12. You're not allowed to ride your bike this far. And then <laughs> I started to like really get into it. And then my mom was like, well, maybe we should look into he's obviously really good at riding his bike. So I started like BMX racing. And that was like my first, my first like addictive sport that I ever did. And I, I raced all over. I was, um, I was number 15 in the country most years. That was like my 10 to 15 range. And then one year I was number one. And then I had to go to Australia for world championships, but nobody in my family really like flew. They're all kind of scared of flying. So I never went. Oh man, what a shame. But even just forfeiting, like to go to the world championships, I still got, I was like 35th in the world that year, which is pretty cool. Fuck. And then into high school, I transferred like all that riding and stuff kind of transferred into, you know, I had some pretty good cardio. So I started running track and cross country. I also played football. I played lacrosse. I did all the sports, but nothing really, I didn't really love anything to the point where it's like really like, you know, sweep me off my feet. I did like track a lot, but I had a coach who he ran us so much that like I, I wound up getting kind of like a little bit of knee pain and it was a lot. I was running like 80 to hundred miles a week as a young kid which is a lot. I don't know if you know what that is. And it's probably kilometers for you. No, no, no. We're, we're miles as well, man. That's the only thing. Oh, cool. You're on the wrong side of the road. You're using Fahrenheit instead of Celsius. But I'll stick to the fact that you know that miles is miles, right? <laughs> That's good. All right. So from there, um, I wound up thinking I was going to go be a pilot someday. After all the sports and everything, I, I actually got a really good scholarship to run at an Ivy League school, which is Cornell University, if you, if you know who they are. And I turned it down because I was kind of overrunning. So then I was like, all right, I want to go be a pilot. That sounds cool. It sounds fun. It's right up my alley. You know, I was kind of an adventure, kind of junky. Military? Military but, pilot or like commercial stuff? Commercial stuff. So I actually moved to – as soon as school was over, you know, obviously I didn't really like the way I felt in my family. So I went as far away as possible. I lived in New Jersey and I lived in Hawaii. So, that, is, that is as far away as you can get, yeah. <laughs> I got far away. I went to pilot school. I got my helicopter license. That was my first first job. So I was a helicopter pilot, and I kind of missed like doing other things. Like I missed like working out, and I I missed that that feeling. So one day I was actually just walking through the dorms where I was living for because I was going to school as well, and there was a sign that said, you know, tryouts for bobsled and skeleton for the U.S. Olympic team or whatever. In Hawaii. And in Hawaii. So they, Verizon, the phone company, they were going to every single state, all 50 states, trying to recruit people. Shit. And, and I see this sign, and I was like, man, that would be sweet, you know? Uh, so I was like, I just decided I was just going to go to tryouts and see how I did. And I went to the tryouts, and I got like third in the nation. So <laughs> it was having it never was like, Having never bobsledded before. No, but... The, the the combine was a three rep max back squat, okay, yeah, a one a one rep max power clean, a vertical jump. There was a sprint where they had timing eyes, and it would it would be fifteen meters, thirty meters, and forty five. And then there was an underhand like medicine ball toss. So okay. like out of all the numbers, I had these crazy scores. I didn't even have any idea that I was you know. Even when it was all said and done, I was like, "Is that good?" And they're like, "Dude, those numbers are insane." So before I knew it, like within like six months, I had flown out to Utah and lived in Utah for about five years and then actually made it all the way up to like potentially being on the Olympic team. And I hurt my hamstring and I never went to the Olympics. Fuck. I know. So that's, that's twice now that you've got essentially next to the top. How old are you here? Like 22 is that that age? Yeah. Right around there. Cool. So the, by the age of 22, you've got to the top flight in two different sports, two very different sports. One's on ice, one's on a bike. Um, and both times through kind of no real error or inability on your part, you've just kind of fallen short. Oh, well, that transfers over again when I go to CrossFit. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a theme, there's a theme happening here. Um. So, yeah, like... What was, your time, get to, what, what was your time like in Utah? Do you enjoy it there? I actually hated it. Like, why? why? The entire time I lived there, I was like, this is so boring. 
Um, there's really nothing to do here. I lived in Park City, which is a very small town up in the mountains. Lots of Mormons. And I, yep. I mean, you can definitely feel the Mormon influence, but you know, funny story is I didn't even know what a Mormon was. <clears throat> Some one of the guys on my team was like, we were we were training together. And he was a. I started as a skeleton athlete, so head first. Fuck, that's the that's the real scary one, man. That's the yeah. balls to the wall one. I wasn't big enough for bobsled yet. I was only like 165 pounds. Okay. 160, 165 pounds. I was pretty small at the time. And I, the only thing I qualified for was skeleton at that time. So in the beginning, I started at skeleton camp and was with these kids who all did skeleton. And this one kid who was really, really good, he was telling me how he was going to go on a mission. And he's like, hey, I'm going on a mission and I'll, I'll be ba- I'm going to be back. I'll be gone for like two years. And I was like, a mission? Like, you're going in the Marines? <laughs> and then... <laughs> you and Tom Cruise? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm Mormon. I was like, yeah, but a mission is like military stuff, right? And, and he's like, no. He's like, do you know where you are right now? And I was like, no, I have no idea. <laughs> and then he tells me like what Mormon people are. Because I had... Dude, I had no... Thank God he told me though, because I went on some dates with some girls where it made a lot of sense. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so after all that, where am I now? So I'm in, I'm in Utah. Yeah, and then as I get older, now I look back and I'm like, man, I I really messed it up because Utah is a really cool place. There's all these hikes to do that I'm into now, and all these great places to see, and it's 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 an amazing place actually. And at the time, I just I was one of those people who was like a thousand percent into something and didn't care about anything else. Mm. And I look back now and I see the younger version of myself in my gym, the manager of my gym right now, this girl Summer, she's just, she's so into CrossFit. It's the only thing that matters and nothing else matters. And I get that. Like I was there for everything I've ever done. And I just think I'm like, man, if, if you'd have just brought in a little bit more flexibility into your life, like you just liked a few other things, I think you'd be better because there's years of my life that I almost don't even remember because I was so strict on my life. Like I didn't go out. I only ate this. I only went to bed at this time. Like I always worked out. Like everything was so structured and I didn't even care about anything else. I was like, I don't give a fuck. I'm just going to be a machine until I just win everything. Mm. Isn't it interesting? So we love athletes that are at the peak of their sport, right? You look at someone like Eddie Hall, world's strongest man, but he was adamant that if he'd kept going for a couple of years, he'd have been divorced from his wife and probably dead from a heart attack. But as the, the people for whom sport is everything they've got or everything they want, they have to make those sacrifices because if they don't, you'll get out competed by the Eddie Hall of bobsled or the Eddie Hall of like skeleton or whatever. But you are right. Like when you look back, the benefit of 2020 vision in hindsight is that you can always think, fuck, if I'd sacrificed 2% of that, I could have benefited maybe 20% of life. I could have gone gone done a, a hike. I have a friend who lives in Utah and out of her front door, I saw this video and it's just normal, total normal neighborhood, but the background's just mountains, like some Lord of the Rings shit. And I'm like, yeah. that looks so amazing. But obviously for you, yeah. you were like, no, nah, head down, crack on. And that's the sacrifice yeah. you got to make. But like you say, with, with hindsight, it's more challenging. Yeah, it's, I look back and I'm like, I really wasted some years for sure. <clears throat> but I mean, it, it, for me at the time, I would, I would tell you that I was happy and I was, you know, I was doing what I, what I love to do. Mm. And that's really the, the, the trade off. I wonder as well, if you'd changed that, whether you would have been happy. You now, in that life, might have been happy with the change-up, but you then didn't want it at all, or you'd have done it. Do you know what I mean? No, I don't think I would have. I think I, I probably would have been miserable. <laughs> yeah. I would have been like, you're, you're taking me out of what I think is best for me right now. Fuck you, older Ryan. Younger Ryan knows yeah. what he's doing. <laughs> there's there's such a different definition of what happy is now. It's, it's unreal. Mm. <laughs> so I guess from there... I start to realize that, you know, I don't want to do this again for another four years, right? The Olympic, nobody gives a shit about my sport until the Olympic year. Even world championships is like the exact same thing as the Olympics and people don't realize this, but like the world championships that happen every year for skeleton, bobsled, skiing, snowboarding, everything is the same thing as the Olympic year. It's just that you don't have the whole world watching. And for us, for the sliding sports, we like to call them skeleton, bobsled, luge, Nobody was there for world championships. Nobody was there for the national events, like none of that stuff. So there was really no allure during, during that time. So to stick it out for another four years to potentially get to that moment and potentially get injured again or something was very scary to me. And I was like, no, 
let's maybe just like go into the military, you know, to go be a pilot. Like I originally wanted to do, or I'll do something else. Like now that I'm an, you know, this really great athlete, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do like special forces or something like that. Just because to be in a helicopter doesn't seem like it's probably best suited for me at this moment. So I started looking into all the special forces branches, like the army, the Navy, the air force, all this stuff. And a friend of mine said, you know, you should really try doing CrossFit. I think that it's a great training tool for anybody going to the military. Even if you're going to go in and be a pilot, you still have to get through boot camp and stuff. And it'd be great to have this under your belt. So I, I walk into a CrossFit gym and the owner of the gym, his name is Tommy Hackenbrock, if you know who this is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The year I walk into his gym, he had just gotten second place at the CrossFit Games. So I didn't know who he was. But as I walked in, I saw his eyes lock on me and he was like, oh, this guy. Like <laughs> he could just tell because I was like really, really fit from bobsled. And I think I was like almost I was almost like 200 pounds at the time and just jacked. And my entire CrossFit career, I've been probably 175 to 180 pounds. So I was a lot bigger than I than I am now. And I remember walking in and he, he saw me and we had this intro class together where he gives me like a, we just do like a pretty basic workout. And there's five other people that are there for this basic workout as well. And as, after the workout, I remember he's just looking at me and he's like, dude, I need someone like you to train with. And I'm like, well, I don't know how to do any of this stuff. I'm just here because I heard that this was going to be cool. I wanted to go in the military. And he's like, well, you know, if, if you agree to come at like certain times, like when I train, you don't have to pay for a membership and you know, you can help me train for events. And I think that, I think this might be something you really like. Is this in Utah? This is in Utah in yep. Salt Lake city. Got you. So I decided I was no longer going to do bobsled anymore. And I moved from park city to Salt Lake city, which is like 30 minutes down a giant mountain. <laughs> that's, the most, then, that's the most like Utah uh, direction ever. It's like, go 30 <laughs> minutes down the mountain. You will find the city. <laughs> so the city was there and I'm living in the city and I'm, and I'm finishing my degree at the university and I go to this gym and I meet him. So then we just start training all the time. And probably within a few months, I had articles about me all over the place that I was like this freak athlete and everybody was excited to see me go to regionals and excited to see me go to the games. And you can look up old articles. I was like the dark horse athlete and all this stuff. And it kind of gave me a big head. I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to fucking crush this sport, you know? So I went to my first regional, which would have been, had I gotten top three, I would have went to the CrossFit games. And it was almost like everybody was like, oh, Ryan's definitely getting top three. And I went and I got like 14th because I had absolutely no idea how to compete. Like I was insanely good, but I had no idea what I was doing. Like handstand push-ups, for instance, you had to flip up on the wall mm -hmm. and do a handstand push-up, you know, with your butt facing the wall. And I would lay on my stomach and walk my stomach to the wall and then do handstand push-ups. <laughs> because I was too scared. I was too scared to flip. I had never done that yet. Okay, yeah. And I saw I saw the workout, and the first workout that really screwed me for the whole thing was it was a thousand meter run, thirty handstand push-ups, thousand meter row. That's it. Pretty Which simple. is such an easy such an easy event now. People would kill that. Now it would be like a hundred handstand push-ups and then a thousand meter row. So I get on the, the wall and I walk myself up and start doing handstands and the guy's like, dude, no fucking rep. Like, what the <laughs> fuck is this? <laughs> so I'm, he's like, you have to flip up. And I'm like, dude, I'm like terrified. So like I, I try to flip up, you know, I, I had done it at the gym a few times and I just never liked the feeling, but I got it done. And after that event, I knew I was basically fucked. So now, now I should just have fun and just enjoy the moment. And then after that, I was like, well, fuck this. Like, I'm fuck the whole military thing. I have to come back and I have to own this, you know? So the next year I came back to regionals and I got fourth place. <laughs> oh shit. One outside. One outside of the game. And Which, it was um, because what, of what regional is Utah? Uh, it was Southwest at the time. That was the regional. But then I moved to California because after in that, my head, I, after that second year, after that first regional, I moved to California. Got you. So I moved to California because I figured no matter how the next year went in CrossFit or whatever, I still wanted to go into the military. So all the Navy SEALs and stuff were training in San Diego in California. So I moved to San Diego to train with military guys. And then during that time, I kept, tr I kept doing my training 
for regionals and I got a job at a CrossFit gym. So I moved out to San Diego. I start training and I go to the regionals and I wound up getting fourth place, which sucked. And the whole reason I got fourth, uh, fourth place for this particular event, I got top five in every single event at regionals. I would have destroyed regionals. But one of the events, I got like 24th place because I didn't, I didn't know how to do a hang clean. <laughs> like I had done power cleans and shit like in my training, but like doing hang power cleans with 225 pounds to me was like devastating. Because we had to do 30 of them in a workout and I like could not hang on to the bar. So everybody was doing like sets of two to five reps at a time and I was doing like one at a time. So I wound up getting fourth place and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I was like, fuck this, you know? <clears throat> so after this time, after that, that year, that's when things like really start to change for me. This is when I really start to figure out who I'm going to be and what my future is going to be. Because after regionals, Obviously, I wanted to be a complete maniac and just be the most diligent person you've ever seen in your life and just crush everything. But I was having problems at work, and I hated the gym that I worked at. The girl who owned it was running it more like a boot camp than a CrossFit gym, and I was a diehard CrossFitter. I wanted to see lifting in the workouts, not just like long Metcons every day. I wanted to see you know, skill work. I, I wanted to see like true CrossFit. So we bumped heads a lot, and eventually I got to the point where I was like, you know what? I don't respect you as a gym owner. Like, I don't like what you're doing. It's not, it's not the right way. You guys hired me to do a job. Let me do it. And it was, she's a female. So you tell a female, you don't respect her. It doesn't work out very well. I didn't like theoretically tell her I didn't respect her. I told her like, I actually don't respect you <laughs> as a human. <laughs> and, she, and she just lost it. So like we wound up getting in this big fight and I, I was like, you know what? Fuck you. I quit anyway. I don't care. Whatever. And she had three partners, and her three partners were begging me to stay. So I tried to stay for like a couple more weeks, but I'd see her every day, and I was like, I can't do this. It's like walking on eggshells at work. I don't like it. Mm. So I had about $5,000 maybe saved up, so I quit. About two months went by with my $2,000 a month rent, and now I have like 1000 bucks left, but not really 1000 Like I had spent money on food and gas and you know living my life. So I got like a couple hundred dollars left and I had written emails to every gym in town that I want a job. I had, I had applied for a million different jobs. I had two internship opportunities, one with Stanford and one with Notre Dame because I had done really well in school and I could have went and become a strength conditioning, an assistant strength conditioning coach, but it was non-pay for like nine months or something. And I didn't have any money. So I called the schools and I was like, Hey, I want to take this internship, but I need at least like, give me housing, give me a, give me like a student athlete meal plan. Give me something that I can live on. And none of them were willing to do anything. So I had to turn down these amazing opportunities. So from there, I'm just like, basically like, fuck, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> this sucks. And I had gotten a membership, a very discounted membership. It was like $200 a month, but these guys let me work out for like $30 a month at this gym called Pacific Beach CrossFit. And that's where I met a man named Anders Varner and another guy named Brian Borstein, who Anders Varner now, I'm, I'm, my podcast is on his network, Barbell Shrug. So when I first met him, you know, they're going off my resume. And my resume says, you know, I just gotten fourth place at regionals. I was a helicopter pilot. I was on the Olympic bobsled team. Like, this you know, guy's I have, a freak. Yeah, I have my degree in exercise physiology, a degree in nutrition. You know, all these different things. And my friend is like, dude, this guy is going to be intense. And then, like, I walk in the gym and, you know, we do a workout together and they're like, holy fuck, this guy is cool. You know, like, they really liked me. And I, but I just got done telling them I had no money. And, like, the reason I hit him up is because, you know, I just want a place to train. So they were like, well, dude, you can train here. Like, you, you know, you can't train here for free, but we can train here for, you know, like $30 or whatever. And it was really, really cheap. So I was like, all right, cool. I didn't, I couldn't even afford that. <laughs> and like after, I think like this next month, my mom might have given me money for rent because I remember still having a house to live in. Are you still in, and is this San Diego still? This gym? I'm still in San Diego. Yep. Yeah. So I had like gained the respect of everybody in the gym. Everybody started to love me. And after that month, my mom was like, you know, I'm not going to help you anymore. Like there's really, there's no need for me to help you. You need to figure your life out. And I really think you should go back to school. I think you should give up on 
this whole CrossFit thing. And I don't really like the idea of the military and like all these different things. So, man, I had a lot to think about. And I think what really started to happen was I just was running out of money and I didn't know what to do anymore. So I had to come come to grips with my friends and tell them like, hey, I don't have any money and I'm, I might have to drive all the way home to New Jersey to my mom's house and then go back to school and do something I potentially don't even want to do. So everybody in the gym was like heartbroken over this. They're like, no way, like not Ryan, like blah, 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 blah. We want him to stay. And there was this girl named Erin Dwyer. And she's like, you know what? You can sleep on my couch if you want for as long as you need to get on your feet. And, but I had never talked to this girl in my life. She just like, everybody seems to like you. You know, I'm a nurse. I'm not home all that much. And, you know, it's there for you. And I originally turned it down and then got to the point where I had to move all my stuff out of my house that I was living in. And I sold all my stuff and I had slept in my car for like a week. And I was like, just was like, I can't do this. This is not, this doesn't right. You know? So during that week, actually, is when I started to steal, I started stealing, uh, like food and groceries and stuff from the grocery store because I wanted to stay and I didn't have any money. Why did you turn it down originally? Why did you turn her offer down? Was it pride? No, definitely not. I, I was definitely like willing to take people's help. It was just that I didn't realize I was that far down. Yeah. Like where like that was what I needed. You know, I kept I always in my mind I'm like such an optimistic guy and I'm I'm always like pretty pretty bubbly kind of I always feel like everything's gonna work out, you know? But yeah. like it was that one moment where it was like, dude, it's it's fucking not going to work out. You've been in your car for a week. You've been like, <laughs> yeah. stealing stuff from Whole Foods. Like you got to take the couch. Yeah. So, and it was also like weird because I didn't know her. It was like, I genuinely, I didn't take classes with her. I didn't work out with her. Like I didn't know her at all. Like I know her, I knew her about as long as we know each other on this podcast. So I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to do it. And I wound up sleeping on her couch for like four months. It was a long time <laughs> and it was a very embarrassing time like to wake up every day just knowing that you're like in somebody's space and they probably thought you were going to be there for like maybe a month and now it's like four months. Yeah. So that started to feel very, very shitty and, and I'll, I'll never forget during that whole time, I'll never forget what it was like to go to bed. So like every single night when I would go to sleep, it would just be like full anxiety, just like why are you even sleeping? Like you don't have anything together. Like you have no reason to wake up tomorrow rather than to wake than to work out. Like you're a fucking bum. Like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like it, and it, it really like crushed my soul. Like every day I was like, man, like I looked at my resume and I was like, this is who I am. But like, this is where I'm at right now. And I don't understand it. And it was, it was hard, man. It was really hard to sleep. It was really hard to just like, want to show up the next day but I kept showing up and doing what I did best at the time and this is when I really feel like you know when you when all else fails like just keep doing what you love and there'll be a way that it works out everybody in the gym at the time had kind of signed me up for this competition called the OC throwdown and it was besides the CrossFit games it was the biggest CrossFit event in the world and you would do these workouts and you would tape your your workout and you'd put it online and then you'd get placed uh you know first to a thousand or whatever. And getting invites was like all the top athletes in the world, like all the best crossers. If you'd been to the games, you got a, uh, an official invite to this competition. But a lot of them still had to do the open online workouts. I got second in the world on these online workouts. And it was the first time anybody had ever seen me work out who hadn't been to regionals. So like social media wasn't that big yet it was kind of like just starting. I think Instagram had like just started. So I would go crush at regionals and the only people who would know me are like, you know, the local crowd. But now the whole world knew who I was and they were like, wow, this guy's insane. And like at the time I never worked out in shoes. I always worked out barefoot because I had one pair. I had like one good pair of shoes and I didn't want to ruin them. So I'd always just take them off. <laughs> so like all of my old videos, I'm, I'm back squatting, Everybody was really into the 20 rep back squat back then and I'd be I'd be doing 20 rep back squat and like like 365 375 pounds and I'm barefoot and like sweaty, one time, sweaty feet on a slippy floor. There was one time I did 335 and I lost count. So instead of 20 I did like 30 reps. <laughs> and I have all these things like recorded and I would start putting them on Facebook and people were like this guy is insane cuz like 
no one had had numbers like that in CrossFit. Like, yeah, like strongman and all that. I'm sure it was going on everywhere. But in CrossFit, man, I was snatching 275 when like 225 was cool. And like I was back squatting 500 pounds when 365 was cool. Like I was so beyond the numbers. And then all of a sudden I started throwing down like insane Metcons. I was doing Fran in under two minutes. You know, I was doing Grace in like a minute, you know, like just crazy, crazy things. Like everything was unbroken. I was like two minutes faster than everybody on Helen. Just crazy stuff. So everybody was really, really excited to watch me go to those he threw out and actually compete. And then I get my letter that says, hey, you know, welcome to the throwdown. And, you know, you got to sign this out, like fill this out and then pay. And it was $200. And I was like, $200? I was like, there is no way I can go to this. So I never, I just, I just let it go. And I get a phone call like a month later from the guy who's throwing the event. And he says, hey, like, you never filled out the thing. Everybody wants to see you. And I'm like, dude. I'm really embarrassed to tell you this, but like I am legitimately like I have nothing. I'm sitting on some girl's couch. There is I don't I to be honest, I've been stealing food for like four months. Like I, I genuinely have nothing. I'm like, I don't, the, like the no shoes that you see in the videos. It's not a joke. That's like real life shit. So he's like, well, all right, I understand your situation. Let's just we'll comp your your we'll make it free for you. And if you win, you just pay me back. And I'm like, all right, cool. You know, so I get all excited. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go to this big event. This is going to be crazy. <clears throat> so I went to the big event and I'm still sleeping on the couch. <laughs> did, you, did you have shoes by this point? Borrowed, borrowed shoes. So my one sne- pair of sneakers I did wear for certain events and I have photos of them. Actually, the original sneakers are still in my closet in my room. I never got rid of them. I haven't worn them in like, probably six or seven years but they're just in my closet i can't throw them away probably for the best that you haven't worn them i can't but i wouldn't (laughs) like to imagine what sort of a state they're in um so at the actual event i needed like lifting shoes and knee sleeves and belts and all that stuff was borrowed and like all my clothes were like stolen like i mean it was just a complete i was a complete like yard sale of stuff so i got second place at this event And I had beaten people who were top three at the CrossFit Games. And it was a huge, huge deal. And the scoring was all messed up. So, like, in reality, they found out later that I had actually won the event. But it was too late to give me prize money or anything like that, which I would have changed my life. No prize money for second place, no? No, it was 10000 for first, though. That would have totally changed my life. Wow. I would have been like, I would have been like, that would have been like rich money. Like, I would have been like crazy. Yeah. So, even think about that is crazy. So... After that, I did get a bunch of sponsors. I got like ProGenX was a protein sponsor. This clothing company started sponsoring me. All these other gyms, you know, were like, yeah, you can totally work at my gym. I got all these job opportunities. So I wound up moving to Los Angeles. And I did not like that experience like at all. I did not like living in LA. I didn't like living in the city, especially Los Angeles. It was where I was at. Like obviously I didn't have a lot of money. It was very poor and like just super grungy, dirty. And the gym that I was working out at wasn't very, they weren't very known for being a very good gym. They were kind of, you know, Ronnie Teasdale. No, he was kind of, he was kind of a badass at the time where he was very in like controversial type of person. He wrote a big article once about how like fat people were ruining the world and like ruining the gene pool (laughs) and like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. This guy, this guy's intense. So CrossFit really hated him because he wrote all these crazy controversial articles and he was an amazing athlete. Actually, he had gone to regional several times and always went to the games as well. But now you have, you know, me linking up, going to his gym. I start like coaching a ton of classes, start saving up dough. And then I wanted to train more. So I started getting more into like personal training and I'll never forget the first time, because I don't think I'd ever made more than $25 an hour in my life at that time. And I'll never forget having this kid come in. He was like an actor and he was getting ready to be on an Apple commercial and he wanted to, he wanted to look, look good. Right. And I'm like, all right, yeah, well, you know, you can come in, you got to come in like three, four days a week and you know, we'll do this and this. And I showed him like what we would do, like a strength template and all this stuff. And he was all excited. And he's like, well, how much is it? And in my mind, I was like, dude, I'd be so happy if I just got like $50. But I didn't have any money. I'm like still coming out of this hole of no money. 
And I'm like, it's a hundred dollars a session. And like, I really don't like to work with people unless they buy at least like 10 up front because it lets me know that you're committed. And I remember him just being like, yeah, like no problem, you know? And, and then after we got done talking, he walked away. And I, I'll never forget. I, I went inside the bathroom and I just started like screaming. I was like, oh my God, I was like, <laughs> I'm about to make a thousand dollars. This is insane. So that feeling just like never went away. So I started just selling people on personal training all the time. And I was like, started getting really good at it. And then eventually after about a year, I had saved up $60,000 in cash. Like I had paid for all my expenses. and I had $60,000 saved. Where are you keeping $60,000? Shoebox under the bed? No, I put it in the bank. Oh, right. okay. Okay. I wasn't like investing in or anything. I was just sitting in a savings account. Got you. So I wound up at one of these competitions that I went to during that time. I met with this kid named Kenny Leverage and he was a CrossFit Games athlete. And he was just like begging me to come move down to Newport Beach where he lived, which is where I live now. And it's obviously a much different vibe, totally different place. So I'm on the beach now and it's more of like a town type of feel, like more like family-like and stuff. It's not like grungy bums running around the neighborhood type of place like where I was in LA. So obviously I loved it here and he got me a job at the gym that he worked at. So I moved and I was only, I was only there for, uh, I think I was there for like a year and a half before I decided to open my own gym. So the, my time in LA and that year and a half, that was when I had $60,000. So all of that time. And I met these two guys that I was personal training at the time who looked like bums, by the way. Like they looked like normal, total normal dudes. They always even sounded normal. Like I, w- I never heard anything crazy come out of their mouth. And they just always asked me what I wanted to do with my life and blah, 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 blah. Because they always saw something, something in me that they – just thought that I had a little something extra than the other coaches. So I was like, well, I would love to own my own gym, but there's so many around. Like at the time, the Orange County area, which is where I live, we had like a record. We think we had 16 gyms in the area, like in a small 10 mile radius, like not very much. So to open a gym here was like considered madness. So I told them that I'm like, well, I'd love to own my own gym, but there's 16 here. Like, What do you want me to do? And he's like, well, I think that the person sells the gym. So like, I think that you would be fine. And I'm like, I disagree. I feel like people come because their friends are here or because it's the closest one. So if, if that's all I have to work off of, I want to make sure that when you walk in, there's no way you walk out. So if you guys give me a million dollars, I will open a gym. And they were like, fine. Like it was nothing. And I was like, Okay. So <laughs> it was, it was, it was literally that, that simple. Like to them, it was just like, okay, go find your space, go fucking pimp it out and let's go. And I was like, wow. Okay. So like within a couple of weeks, we had found the space. It wasn't even for rent. The CrossFit Chalk Gym that I own right now was a real working gym at the time. And we gave them at the time they wanted $200,000 to leave. Cause they had put $700,000 in like upgrades to the building. And they're like, we'll leave if you give us this much money. And we're like, no, we're not giving you a penny more than like 50 grand. So eventually they took it. We took over the space and then I created what now is CrossFit chalk. And I did not need a million dollars. I needed like 250 grand was like still more than I could spend pretty much at the time. Mm. But I did need money for like salaries and pay and like what if we didn't make money for a year, like a lot of different things. But the gym is like a legitimate million dollar gym, which at the time was completely unheard of. Like after I opened my gym, I was in almost every single CrossFit magazine immediately. Like the way that it looked and like the way that I was running it and all this like was was completely unheard of at the time. What was different about it? When you walked in, it looked almost nicer than like an Equinox, but it was like a functional fitness gym. I had all of the competition plates lined up against the wall on a rig, like $30,000 in competition plates, which at the time, you know, doing my due diligence of other gyms and what they had and what they were offering, like everybody had at the time, the rubber plates. Nobody was putting in these expensive plates. Like if I put rubber plates in, my whole gym would have been seven grand. And everybody was all about starting 
in your garage and then eventually going to a small space and then a bigger space and like going step by step by step. And I was always like under the impression the most, the most, well, the, the gyms that every, that was really doing well, like all the gyms that are doing well, you have like soul cycle, you have Barry's Boot Camp, you have, I don't know, whatever you guys have by you, but like they're, they're big franchise gyms and they never come out and they're like, you know what? Let's just start this soul cycle in a garage. And then if it gets bigger, we're going to go to this small space. And then if that gets bigger, we'll go to a really nice space somewhere and see what happens. They're like, no, let's just fucking go to the nice place now. Let's put 50 bikes in there. We're going to fill it. Like, how do you feel when you walk in a gym and there's two rowers and four kettlebells and you're like, it's $200 a month and we're going to do this. And you're like, what? It doesn't make any sense. So like that to me always blew me away. And, um, I, I, I was like, if I ever get to open a gym, I'm never going to do that. That seems absolutely ridiculous. So, you know, I, I decked the whole gym out and all the nicest stuff. I had 10 assault bikes. I had 10 rowers. I had fucking like 80 kettlebells, all these dumbbells, like stacks of dumbbells. Like at any point, anybody in class could have any weight they want. And I would never have to worry about not having enough equipment, which was always embarrassing as a coach. Cause you'd have a workout with an RX weight. And then, like half the people couldn't do it. Do you remember when? Like, uh, well, do, you, do you remember when the uh, twenty-two and a half kilo dumbbells came out? Was it uh, seventeen one or eighteen one? And there was like you were seeing all these videos going out online of someone with that like, fifteen kilo dumbbell with a couple of plates duct taped onto the end of them. Yeah, yeah, that was ridiculous. So like, <laughs> <laughs> also CrossFit really fucked that up though, because like everybody in the free world had like forty-five pound dumbbells, but nobody had fifties, and I was like. Even now, I have this giant stack of 45s and a giant stack of 50s, and I'm like, do I really need two stacks of a five-pound difference? But yeah, yeah. That was Roe trying to make some money. They probably had tons of 50-pound dumbbells sitting around. They're like, fuck, fuck what do we do with these? Guys, no one's, no one's using these 22 and a half kilo dumbbells. What can we do? Dave, <laughs> mate, um, is there any chance that you could... Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> There's Dave Castro. Just We've got like a rogue t-shirt for every day of the year. Oh yeah. <laughs> my, my, my goal was to make it to the CrossFit games and wear a t-shirt that says, um, my mama don't like you and she likes everybody. And it has Dave Castro on it. Nice. <laughs> the, the, Just, the Justin Bieber line. Yeah. Dave Castro, a funny story. Dave Castro was the second ever podcast that I did. So I got invited. Oh, down. Really? I got invited down to 18.0 by Reebok. Um, they did that. Do you remember that? Did you ever see that? Yeah. Yeah. So the eighteen point zero announcement, and um, I'm sitting down with Dave, and I've like I, I've done one podcast before this, right? And I love I love podcast. I've been a guest or whatever, but I'd never done one before. And you sit down, and Dan Bailey was coming up after Dave, so Dan Bailey was number three, and Dan's already met me. Hey man, how's it going? This, that, and the other. And then Dave's kind of he's he's kind of a bit I don't know intimidating to kind of speak to, and I didn't really yeah. know didn't really know how it was going to go, and then. Just before we started, Dave was like, so what are we doing here? And I was like, oh, I'm about to record a podcast. Dave's like, don't really do podcasts. I was like, right, okay, well, I'm just going to get you to count to five for me, please, Dave, if that's okay. And I just kind of steamrolled through that. But um, And then I asked him, uh, what did I say? Would you rather fight uh, 10 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? Um, and I was I was just <laughs> asking him whatever I could think of to like try and lighten the mood a little bit. Um, and I asked him about who would you not want to face out of the CrossFit games, uh, in the hunger games. And he was like, I don't know what that is. I was like, it's kind of like battle Royale. <laughs> and he went, battle Royale. Do you mean WWE? And I was like, <laughs> no, Dave, where have you been? Do you not watch any movies? Yeah. He hasn't really been to a lot of places. I don't think. No, he's kind of in his, and world. he's not a, he- He's not a happy man, so. <laughs> he, he, anyway, he was it was interesting the difference between him and Dan. Then Dan comes out, and Dan's just like super funny, super relaxed. But yeah, so you yeah. you're in the gym, you've opened the gym, you've got thirty thousand dollars of weights, plates, and bars, and all that stuff. Yeah, and I mean, I, I probably spent about a hundred grand on equipment, a hundred thousand dollars probably on equipment, and then I put like a, maybe another hundred thousand dollars into like the build of the building, just like painting and changing things, making it nicer. My bathrooms were like $250,000, but I didn't have to do that. There was the person before us. Like uh-huh. that, was part of the, that was part of the money that they wanted to get back. So now I have like theoretically about a million dollar gym. And my first day open, I had like 100 members. And I didn't even do any pre-sales. I just like opened and everybody came. Because during that time, I was posting on Instagram because Instagram was just starting to get big. And I started posting like, hey, 
I just bought 30 grand in Olympic lifting plates. Here's the, here's the space before all the weights. Here's, you know, where we are in town, which is like a really nice commercial area. And everybody else was in industrial areas. And like, it was the first time somebody was going to go and spend like my rents, like $11,000 a month. It's crazy. Shit. And everybody, everybody before that was spending like three, $4,000 in like a little garage style space. So I'm in this nice area. Everybody sees the gym all painted and pretty. Then they see the weights come in. Then they see all these rigs and all this stuff, all the rowers, all the bikes. They're like, holy shit, this place is going to be insane. So without me knowing, everybody's putting in their 30-day notice at all the gyms, you know, <laughs> and they're all like getting ready to come. And I have a video on my computer. Like the first day, I'm just packed. And I, every, everybody told me, you know, if you get 100 members in your first year, you're doing really good. I had 100 members my first day. Shit. But – I'm so anal and I'm so like, you know, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. I don't want to blow it. You know, my, this, this last year has been very stressful for me. You know, like I had a lot of ups and downs, like the last three years really. And it was very important to me to have the right people there. Like when it started, I had zero coaches. <laughs> <laughs> I coached every, every single class, every single day for two months before I hired my first coach. What was the timetable? So 5 a.m. was the first class, and then 7.45 p.m. was the last one. So I'd get home, I would get home at usually about 10 and then get back to the gym at about 4 a.m. So I would leave the gym at 10. By the time I actually went to bed, it would be like midnight, and then I'd wake up at 4. Sometimes I'd wake up at like 3 because I'd be nervous to wake up at 4. And then before I knew it, I was only sleeping like three or four hours a night for – those whole two months. And I was like a complete zombie, but there was this other girl who had gone to regionals. I'd met her a few times and she kept emailing me, you know, I really want to go on a coach there and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, all right, well, you know, you come and let me, we'll see how you do and whatever. So she did a great job and I had to like watch her every day for like a month. So it basically was like me still running all the classes every day, but I'd get to like kind of sit off to the corner and just, you know, get to write workouts and, do management stuff, which I didn't realize how much really went into it. You know, I thought opening a gym was, you know, you open it and you have this many members and this is your expenses and off you go. It's not like that at all. So people always ask me about opening a gym now and I'm like, please, for the love of God, do not open a gym. Like you, <laughs> you genuinely just don't understand. And I was so lucky in my opportunity and like I, something tells me you don't have the same luck that I had at that moment because just like – the height of CrossFit, the height of my career, like the insanity of what my, what my gym looked like, the fact that Instagram was climbing at the time. I had so many things in my favor that people just don't have now that for you to replicate that is almost impossible. But, and I was like the top trainer at the gym I was at. Like everybody wanted to go with me. Like the, the owner of that gym was never there. He didn't care about the gym. He didn't stop in. Like it was, there was no connection to him. So when I left, it was just natural for them to come. I think like 40 people probably came from the gym that I was at before. And then everybody else just saw us on Instagram. So that was like kind of, kind of all going on. And during this whole situation, I'm still training for regionals. <laughs> and everybody four still hours, wanted to- Four hours sleep a night. Yeah. And everybody still wanted to see me go to the games and all that. But the year prior to this was when I actually threatened to murder that judge in front of everybody. Yeah, tell us that story. <laughs> so <laughs> this was before the gym was open. And this is while I'm still saving money. I understand that in the future I'm probably going to open a gym. And like my whole life before that time, I just got done being homeless. Like all these different factors. Like CrossFit's my life basically. And I'm in this moment and I'm doing a workout that is the one workout at regionals that I could not wait to do. And it was 21, 15, nine deadlifts at 315 and box jumps at 30 inches. I had done 21 deadlifts probably 10 seconds before anyone else even got off the bar because 315 to me at the time was nothing. Like I had a 600 pound deadlift. I was probably the only person in CrossFit that had a 600 pound deadlift at the time. And 315 to me felt like 225. So I fly through it, I get all my box jumps done, I go back to the bar, and now I just start getting no rep like crazy. Like, no rep, no rep, no rep. And there's parts of it where the guys, 
no repping me and he's not even looking at me like <laughs> you're me and he's over here and he's like no rep no rep and he's like looking at the head judge and i'm like you're not even watching me work out this is ridiculous like was it, was it for extension is that what the criticism was it was for bouncing they said i was bouncing the weights and you can watch the video on youtube it's all over the place and i'm just the weight is very very light to me so i'm just going up and down very very fast mm -hmm. So it looks like I'm bouncing it, and it's the first year they had ever had competition plates. And competition plates don't really bounce at all in general. So in the moment, I'm like freaking out. I can feel that because the year before that, I got in fourth at regionals. And this was my year. Like I was going to go to the games 100%. Even with all that, I got dead last in that event, right? Because I freak out. I tell the judge in the middle of the workout, dude, I'm going to fucking kill you. You're like, you're ruining my life. A lot of people like to sit, like to remember that I'm gonna fucking kill you part, mm -hmm. but they don't understand that I said you're gonna, you're ruining my life after that, because like, I can feel like everything, bobsled, skeleton, being homeless, owning that gym, like, not owning that gym, working at that gym that I hated, like, not having any money, stealing, everything is like in that moment, and I'm like, I'm gonna go to the CrossFit Games and everything's gonna be fine, and he was taking it away from me in that moment. And the only thing I could think of is like, dude, I'm going to fucking kill you. Like you're ruining my life. And I guess I like screamed it and scared the fucking guy. And he was like freaking out. And then basically they had to make an example out of me. And like afterwards, like Dave Castro comes over and like publicly humiliates me and like points to me and tells me that I'm a terrible person all over CrossFit. And they, they, exploited it all over the website. Like Ryan Fisher is, you know, completely out of line and a maniac and blah, blah, blah. I got last place in the event, obviously, cause I didn't, they would never give me a rep. So I eventually just like did like a hundred deadlifts instead of 45. And then I wouldn't sign the paper at the end. It was just like a giant, giant fucking ordeal. Huh. <sighs> so after that moment, I was considered the maniac for CrossFit and then opening my gym, actually seemed even crazier at the time because now there are 16 gyms in the area. I'm the complete maniac guy that probably nobody wants to go to his gym because you look him up and he looks like Johnny McEnroe. He's like <laughs> fucking smashing <laughs> tennis rackets everywhere. <laughs> so like, huh, like my mom was like begging me. She's like, Ryan, like your name is not good. Like, you know, you shouldn't open a gym and all these different things, but you know, it worked out <laughs> and I, and, and, and the gym was doing well. So with all that being said, the, the hype for me to go back to regionals was pretty big. Everybody wanted to see me compete again, and they wanted to see me kind of overcome the odds. And that was when I thought that I'd wear that Justin Bieber shirt. My mom don't like you. She likes everyone because my mom fucking hates the guy. And she actually <laughs> called him one day and told him how much she hated him. Your mom rang Dave Castro. Yeah, because after the whole regional event, like he like literally ruined my name. Like it was so bad, and I was like such a good CrossFitter, and everybody just. Everybody still to this day remembers me as the crazy person. Until they meet me, they're like, man, I thought you were going to be totally different. Like, you're actually really nice and blah, blah, blah. And I, everyone always thought you were insane. So she got his phone number at one point somehow and was like, I can't believe you ruined my son's life and like blah, 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 blah and like all this stuff. So I just was like, man, if I make it to the games one day, I want to have this shirt that has like the Justin Bieber little quote on it. And, I, and it'd just be so funny. I love the fact that mums get in to that sort of a thing. You know, I don't know whether you watched the um, Conor McGregor fight this weekend, but at the end of the fight, so he's just smashed Donald Cerrone in 40 seconds, right? And Donald Cerrone's grandmother comes over and like has a word <laughs> with Conor. And it's like, yeah. it's so funny, even at the absolute top flight of the sport or, you know, regionals, this huge event, Conor McGregor, biggest fighter on the planet. It's like, you still got to answer to someone's grandmother. Like the grandmother comes <laughs> over, wags a finger in your face. You're like, oh shit, that's his grandmother. Like I can't, I can't. <laughs> and even Connor, I saw that. Yeah. yeah, he's hard as nails, but you're probably still like weirdly intimidated by the grandmother. <laughs> yeah, it's probably. Yeah. I can imagine for sure. Well, he's, he looked like he said some nice things to her. Um. So yeah, I mean, all that stuff was kind of going on and floating through my head and in my life, and it was a crazy, crazy time for sure. And I'll, I'll never forget all that. But Dave Castro. He didn't go away after that for me. <laughs> when I was opening my gym, he tried to take it away from me. How? Because I, I, I wanted to call the gym 
because they wouldn't accept any of my names for the gym. I really wanted chalk and they wouldn't accept it. And I really wanted this other name like diesel. I wanted like sweat. I wanted to call my gym CrossFit sweat, all these different things. They wouldn't accept anything. And I was like, fuck this. You guys suck. Like I'm going to call my gym CrossFit untitled because you guys won't even settle on a title. And untitled actually means by definition that it's beyond a title. And that, you know, it was like this really interesting definition for what it actually meant. And I didn't want to be associated with CrossFit almost at that time anyway. So someone, I had wrote about this on Facebook and I was like, I want to call my gym CrossFit Untitled because it means this and this and this and this and CrossFit's never been really good to me anyway. And then someone screenshotted it and sent it to Dave. And then Dave writes me an email and he says, you will never own a CrossFit gym, you know, so you can get, you can get rid of this, this name that you want to call it and, you know, basically go fuck yourself. So I'm like, all right, well, there goes that. I guess I'm just opening a regular gym now. Uh, so I write to Kathy Glassman, which is Greg Glassman's wife at the time. And I say, hey, you know what? I'm actually not going to be opening a gym. Apparently, Dave is actually really upset with me. You know, I don't have the greatest, you know, history with you guys. And maybe it's best I just move on and just open my gym as a regular gym. And we just forget this whole CrossFit thing. And then she's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, we do have this one chalk contract. It's been, it's been taken for six months, but no one's ever opened the gym. So maybe you can have that one, but you have to pay the affiliate fee like right now. And I was like, done. I've been fighting for that name for almost a hundred emails. We went back and forth, 88 emails. And every email that I wrote had five names on it. So for my gym. So if you can multiply 88 times five, that's four, how many names four, four, that eight. I, yeah. that's how many names that I suggested before we landed on chalk. It was a nightmare. <laughs> and then even since then, Dave will be in the area and he never stops by my gym. He always stops by this one gym that's like a few miles away and he stops there multiple times. Yeah. Because he always takes photos like in his affiliate, in the affiliates. And like you never go to the same affiliate more than once. Like you'd go to a different one. Mm. But he's been to the same one multiple times now. In Newport Beach, he's got, his, he's got his one favorite. That's interesting. Yeah, man, that's and he never comes to mind, so it's funny. But regardless, after all that, um, the gym, I, I went to regionals again. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Obviously, I had a lot more scrutiny on me for judging. Like There was more judges watching me, and so they, didn't, they wanted me to... They didn't ban you after the... They I'm, didn't ban me, now. I'm going to fucking kill you. You're ruining my life. That, that wasn't yeah. worthy of a ban, but it was worthy of public denouncement. Yeah, and they really wanted to see me freak out again, so they tried very, very hard. And I got drug tested all the time. Like it was ridiculous how much I got. I got drug tested like every couple months. For non games where, athlete. Yep. And then my buddy who was a CrossFit Games athlete was like never getting drug tested. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Like you've gone to the games three times and you've maybe been drug tested one time and it was at regionals. I get drug tested just like sitting in my house, like fucking reading a book, you know what I mean? Like it's ridiculous. So I was always getting drug tested. Well, I, I had that body that everybody wanted to fail. Everybody's like, this guy's definitely on drugs. And I'm like, no, I actually just, I really do eat insanely well. Like I never, ever cheat. You guys are always out partying and eating fucking donuts and shit. And I'm actually only eating chicken and broccoli. So, <laughs> so I just looked the way that I did. But anyway, after all that, the gym was picking up more and it was something that I started to just really pour my heart into. And it was I was starting to realize that, you know, maybe I was maybe meant to be a business person and I had come so close to so many things, right? Like, like we, like we had talked about in so many different sports and business for me, didn't really feel like I had to ever win anything. It was just kind of, you know, how big can I grow this thing? How many people can I help? Like there's a lot of things that make you bigger, but there's no like qualification process really, you know, mm -hmm. you have to evaluate yourself and make sure that you have all your, all your ducks in a row. If, if you will, but yeah, you, you can, you can go as far as you want and there really is no first place or whatever. It's just, where are you comfortable going? And during that time, you know, I didn't like when gyms started small and, and they, and they started to build, like I said, I wanted to come out guns blazing. I also didn't like that gyms would put their workouts on their website. I always thought it was weird. Like every CrossFit gym, you could just go to their website and see their workout. Like that was totally normal. I could, I could look at any CrossFit gym in the world. There's thousands of gyms. I could look up their email address or their website 
go to their page and I can see their workout. Steal a program. Every single, every single day, right? So I was like, this is so weird. I am not doing that. So I never did. But the gym kept getting more followers on Instagram and people would be like, every once in a while I would post a workout that we did. And they'd be like, dude, that workout looks awesome. Or what are you guys doing in there? Like the gym looks amazing. Like you have so many members. Like, and I just opened and like all this stuff. And about three years of this went on where people would ask me the workout. I got to the point where like, I'll never forget. I had a phone call from someone in Norway (laughs) asking me what, what the workout was for the gym that day. I was like, you're from Norway. Like (laughs) why? One, I'm probably spending money on this phone call that I don't want to be spending. (laughs) Have you reversed the charges here, Mr. Person from Oslo? And like, why do you care that much about the workout? And I started to realize that I made workouts much, much different than everybody else. I didn't really spend time looking at other people's websites. But when I realized what I was making, I realized it was much, much different. And I had a drop in who this, this lady would drop in the gyms all over the world for work. And she was like, this is my favorite gym. It's the best program I've ever done. You really should put these workouts online and charge people. And I was like, all right, I'll give it a go, you know? And I was like, I'll charge everybody like a hundred bucks a month or something. And my friend was like, nah, I might not want to do that. That's kind of a lot. Like maybe like $20, something really cheap. And I'm like, $20, you know how long it takes me to do this? Like you out of your mind. And then all my friends were like, well, you're probably going to get like a, you know, you might get like a hundred people that buy it. And I'm like, well, that would be cool. I guess, I guess I could settle for that. <clears throat> be an extra $2,000 a month. I was making like $4,000 a month at the time. Like that was my salary for the gym was 4,000. I'm like, if I had a hundred people on this for $20, I'd be stoked. So I make it $20. The first week that it's out, I made $4,000. And I was like, holy fuck. I was like, I just doubled, I just doubled my salary. And I was like, this is insane. So I still didn't even market it because I was kind of embarrassed to be the guy who didn't go to the CrossFit games and I'm marketing CrossFit programming, you know, like, cause you have like Invictus and like, you know, Rich Froning, which he didn't even have mayhem at the time, but Invictus had a bunch of athletes and they had programming. They didn't even charge for it. And then like comp train with Ben Bergeron, he wasn't charging for it. And like, now all of a sudden you have CrossFit chalk, which is the guy who threatened to murder someone who wants $20 for his programming. <laughs> and it's like, it's like, dude, I don't know about all this. And I'm, I'm like, well, fuck, I just made $4,000. So I think a lot of people really, whether, whether I'm this person who murders people or not, like people really <laughs> like, people really like my workouts. So they're good workouts. Yeah. A couple of months went by and it went from like, I was making $4,000 a month off of it to like $10,000 a month. And I was like, wow, like maybe I should market this thing. Maybe I should actually talk about it. And I still like was like hesitant. So I would, I would do a couple posts like, Hey, I have this programming and blah, blah, blah. If you guys want to follow it. And before I knew it, dude, like even just casually it would start bumping 15, $20,000 a month. And I'm like, holy fuck, this is insane. You know, like I'm making five, six times what I'm making in the gym. And it's really not any extra work. It's the workouts that I'm already doing, but the workouts kept getting more stressful to make for me because now I'm like, well, now it's not just my gym members I want to please. I want all of these people to look at these workouts and be like, fuck, that's dope. You know, even still, like I've owned the gym now for six years. I'm the only person who's ever made the workouts and it, it went from taking me a couple hours to taking me like an entire 24 hour day to make workouts now. Cause I'm so like, I need them to be fucking insane. And now I have three programs. It started off as just CrossFit. And then I, I added the sweat program to it, which is the conditioning program. Cause I started to see that a lot of people weren't really stoked on CrossFit all the time. And they, they still wanted to come to the gym and do that, that circuit like training, but they didn't want to lift all the heavy weights. So I created the sweat program. And then a lot of people were like, well, hey, what do I do when I travel? So I started making this thing called the Daily D, which is the Daily Dumbbell Program. And it's just dumbbells, jump rope, pull-up bar, that's it. Um, so now I have these three different programs. I want all of them to be awesome. So I'm making like 21 workouts every Sunday for the week. And it gets to be pretty hard. But anyway, I started marketing the program more. And it got to the point where it was making, you know, make almost like seven figures in a year now on just online program on that. 
And then it kind of just took off on its own. I, I Even still, I barely ever talk about it. <laughs> like if you follow me on social media, you, you might see me like post or repost someone's thing. And it says like, hey, you can swipe up if you want to join. I talk about it more often on the chalk Instagram, but on mine, it's like very, very rare. Mm -hmm. I don't like to be very salesy with it. And like now it's at the point where people just talk about it and it kind of just flows. But then the challenges started, right? Like I wanted to make, you know, things cooler for people in the gym. So I started doing the nutrition challenges and then it was the same thing. People wanted to do the challenges and it, then I, I opened it up to everybody. So then you have the challenges, you had that, my knees getting worse and worse because it, it was when I was about 30, it was when my knee was really bad and I was to, I was pretty much deciding if I was ever going to compete again because my knee was – since I was like 27, my knee had been bothering me. I had a really bad snowboard accident and tore my ACL, had full reconstruction in my knee. I tore like everything in there. And throughout like all the lifting, through bobsled and skeleton and CrossFit, doing pistols and squatting every single day and doing crazy shit and running marathons and all sorts of stuff, my knee was just shot. And even now, my knee is just like totally gone. So I started training differently in my own training and I started bringing in a lot more bodybuilding stuff, but I loved the sweat of, of CrossFit and I loved like the bikes and the assault bikes and just straight, just dying. So I started mixing together some old ideologies I found in some old articles from this guy named Pat O'Shea from the seventies. And it's, it's kind of the original methodology that Greg Glassman took over and created what, what we know of as CrossFit today. So I started taking a lot of these things and I mixed it with bodybuilding and I started creating this thing called high intensity interval bodybuilding. Cause I love that term hit training. It was like the most Googled term. And I was like, well, how can I spin off of that? So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to take everything I love about CrossFit and everything I love about bodybuilding. and I'm going to mix the two together and I'm going to call it high intensity interval bodybuilding. And I'm going to call it hit instead of hit. And then that fucking thing exploded. So I kind of like stumbled upon everything. And when people ask me like how everything actually happened, I tell them uh, I actually just wanted people to stop emailing me and stop contacting. <laughs> so like the CrossFit pro program was to people for, to stop emailing me and stop asking what the workout was. So I made that. The nutrition programs were all because people kept asking me if they could do what we were doing. And I was like, all right, well, I need to figure out how to stop all these emails. <laughs> and then people asked me what I was doing with my programming. And I was like, all right, well, this is what I'm doing. So here you go. Here's an ebook. You can buy that. That was like my first ebook. And then all that shit just took off. And it was really just a way to get people to stop talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then lo and behold, I become a podcaster. And now I talk for a living. I know. Yeah, <laughs> man. I, so I had, um, I did a podcast. <laughs> I did a podcast quite a while ago that was about a reality TV thing that I went on and it was precisely the same. It was the fact that loads of people would say, hey man, so what, what was it, what's it actually like on Love Island? And I was like, right, I'm going to do this podcast. And now for the rest of time, all that I ever need to do is send them one YouTube link. It's like, there you go. That's an hour. And I've just scaled the, the response. Um, one thing I really want to delve into is what makes your programming different? Do you have some principles that you stick to? You know, there'll be a lot of coaches listening, a lot of guys from the UK, a lot of guys from the US, and they'll be thinking, fuck, like, I want to, I want to upgrade the way that I program for my gym. I, I want to make the, the members feel gassed when they step in. It's going to be different. What is it? So. Yeah, and I actually just made a video about this on my Instagram yesterday. I don't know if you saw it or not. Link it's in my will be kitchen. in the show notes below. <laughs> so basically, I'll never forget my first time that I genuinely wanted to get good at making workouts. I don't remember the age that I was at, but I know I was in college, and I remember the movie 300 came out. And it wasn't just Gerard Butler who was all ripped, like, you know, you know like the main character. It was everybody in the movie. Like, everybody was ripped, and everybody was like, what the fuck are these people doing? Yeah. You know, it was the first movie where everybody was ripped and everybody was like going crazy. It was on the cover of Men's Health Magazine and everything traced back to this guy named Mark Twight. And Mark Twight owned a gym called Jim Jones, mm -hmm. which is another famous kind of branch of gyms. Well, it's actually only one gym, but they do seminars and stuff kind of like CrossFit. To, to interject there, sorry, anyone that's listening who knows who Mark Twight and Mr. Blevins, his uh, partner are, they have a seminar in the UK uh, in the middle of April, and I've finally got a reply off Blevins himself 
and I might be able to get him on while he's over here, which would be really, really cool. So that would be a, a oh, nice that would stuff. be cool. Yeah, he's a, he's an interesting guy. If you've not checked out the Dissect podcast, which is their thing, um, they're they're cool guys. They're underground. They're kind of anti marketing. I really I really like their vibe. Dude, I I wanted to go to their gym so bad. Like at the time in when I was living in Utah, you would see Jim Jones shirts, but you never knew where the gym was. And when you went to the website, it actually said like, we will not disclose location because we are by referral. And you have, or if, if it's not by referral, you need to tell us why you want to work out here. And like, they only accepted people to work out there. It was so badass. It was so badass. I was obsessed. I was like, I have to work out here. And like, I would send them emails and like my responses were never good enough. And like, it was ridiculous. I was like, fuck this place. You know, like this is insane. Yeah. So make him work so, out 300 men's health. Yeah. So I start looking into what he was doing and he, I wound up actually meeting one of his trainers because I never could work out at his gym. And I, I started asking them about, you know, what they do and what their, you know, what their secret sauce is and blah, blah, blah. And they start talking about this thing called IWT training, interval weight training. And I looked that up. And that was basically invented by a guy named Pat O'Shea in the 70s. So I, what you, if you look up now, like the principles behind Jim Jones, you can just Google it and it talks about IWT and Pat O'Shea. And basically a lot of the stuff that they were making was he was the first person, Pat O'Shea in the 70s, making these like high intensity interval workouts with compound lifts. So I know all this information at that time. I'm going to school through exercise physiology. I understand the body when I'm done with school, like I'm, pretty smart. I wind up being on the bobsled team. I wind up doing 10 years of CrossFit. I wind up owning my gym for six years. All these different factors that come into play. I trained tons of different athletes, football players, wrestlers, UFC fighters, all sorts of stuff. And I come to like one conclusion, right? Over time, we're all going to get injured (laughs) at some point if we're going to be sports specific. If we're all going to do CrossFit, we're going to get injured at some point. If we're all going to do UFC. We're all going to get injured at some point. If we all just do bodybuilding, we're probably going to get injured at some point, but a lot lower risk because there's not a lot of like rapid movement and stuff like that. More of like an overuse injury than anything. But all of us are in this weird place where we all mentally like to be fucked. We all like to be in this crazy, ridiculous conditioning base where like we just like to die. Right. And that's why we're listening to this podcast. Probably everybody who's part of this has at some point been on the ground full covered in sweat and all these other athletes, they like doing football and UFC and all these things, because there's a lot of grind to it. So I, I, I mixed together the old school IWT stuff, the, the things I liked about CrossFit, the things I didn't like about CrossFit, I got rid of, right. In my, in my training, like you don't see a lot of overhead squats. You don't see a lot of handstand pushups. You don't see a lot of muscle ups. I have them as advanced options for people who are like, they really want to be good at CrossFit. Like my CrossFit programming, there's advanced options almost every day. And I I like to fancy like both crowds, you know, the competitor and the person who's just doing this to look good and they just love functional training. So that's what makes mine so different. And I also a big fan of maximizing my time. Like I always thought it was weird that people spent 15 minutes doing a clean and jerk, and then they would have a 15, 20 minute conditioning piece. So I'm like, well, why don't we do an EMOM where we're doing like the other day, I, we literally just two days ago, my, my workout for the day was on the first minute you do 15 burpees. And on the second minute you do three clean and jerks. And then after three minutes, you go to two clean and jerks. And then after three minutes, you go to one clean and jerk, but you're always doing 15 burpees. So in like a 20 minute window, you had done 150 burpees and you had built up to a 100 max clean and jerk. Mm-hmm. And then other days I'll do something where it's like a front squat and a rope climb or like a front squat and like a lateral lunge, like a leg superset. Or I'll do like the first piece will be, we'll do like five heavy strict press into like 10 dumbbell bent over rows into 50 double unders minute rest. And you keep going through that sequence for 15, 20 minutes. So it's like a whole compounding superset. So I'm a huge fan of doing supersets. And the reason for that is people are here because they want to do a workout that takes limited time and gets them out the door. But you're my responsibility when you walk out the door. When When you tell someone where you work out, 
I want you to be proud of where you work out. And when you say my name and my facility, I want to make sure that we're doing the best that we can for you to look the best you can. Because if you look mediocre, I'm going to feel mediocre when you tell people you work out at my gym. So I'm not going to just give you some little 15 minute piece. I'm going to give you like a 15, 20 minute compounding piece with a bunch of other stuff. And then we're going to do the same conditioning that everybody else does. But in my own format, even when I think about conditioning, I think of way different factors than other people. I can't stand when someone has a conditioning component and there's something in there that slows you down. Well, like, you know, there's like, there's like 15 wall ball. Maybe it's like 15 wall balls, 15 toes to bar, 15 power cleans at 135 or something like that, right? It's like, all right, well, 15 wall balls I get. 15 toes to bar, you're not going to have very many people hanging on the bar for 15 reps. So let's go ahead and take that down to like maybe seven or eight. And then power cleans, like 15 is kind of a lot in that aspect because you're going to be sitting there doing one at a time. And let's say it's a 10-minute AMRAP. Now you only got like three rounds of this workout, like for most people, right? So let's go, you know, 15 wall balls, seven toes to bar, five power cleans. And then I'll go RX plus option and I'll do 15 wall balls, 10 toes to bar, seven power cleans, and I'll make it 155, you know, something like that. Rather than just write that original workout, I'll write two different versions of it. And I think that, that it gives it the stimulus that it needs for both crowds. What's the sort so, of, what are the sort of adaptations that you're seeing from this sort of a workout? Because there'll be some people, you know, you've got a power lifter who's, who's listening or a weightlifter who's listening, and they think, well, you're going you're gonna to drop down that top end power. You're not going to be able to do a true one rep max if you've got to do 15 burpees in between each round. Or you've got someone who's maybe more into the monostructural side of things, and they're going to think, well, you're not going to be pulling so much on the rower if you've got to do war balls or deadlifts or whatever in between. So what are the sort of adaptations that you see? So that's kind of like what Pat O'Shea's thing was back then, was that you could actually lift maximal loads even with the conditioning component mixed in. And I just did, you know, Wendler? Have you ever heard of the Wendler template, which five three one method? I just did a Wendler 531 method. Granted, I've had this gym for six years. I've had members online for about two and a half now. And I created my first Wendler template that was mixed with IWT format from Pat O'Shea from the 70s. So the first week, for instance, you have your deadlifts. It's 60, it's 65, or 65, 75, 85% on your first week of lifts. There's, there's a more a little bit heavier percentage on week two and three, and then week four is your recovery. Mm-hmm. So you're even you're even so, programming the deloads in there as as in five three one. Yep. So the first part, like on 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 week one of this particular template, I did every four minutes by four rounds. So I put a time cap on it, and then I also added a conditioning co- component in. So I did every four minutes by four rounds. I did four hundred meter run buy in, and then your deadlifts at that percentage that you were supposed to do that day. And then the next week I did a 20 cal assault bike buy-in and then your percentages for your deadlifts. And then week three, I did a 500 meter row buy-in and then your percentage for that, for the deadlifts for that week. And that's the max out week. So the first two weeks I did every four minutes by four rounds. And then the last week I did every five minutes by five rounds. I added an extra round, added an extra minute of rest. I got more PRs than I've ever seen in my entire years of owning the gym online program. I mean, there's literally gold stars on my Wattify account, like just brrr, like just ringing straight across the board. So people are using the conditioning. What, what I think it is, is a lot of people under warm up. So you have these long conditioning pieces mixed in with the lifting and it's actually warming them up to the point where they're actually doing things right for themselves. And then also the stress of time is actually letting them do the lift in an appropriate manner. Because a lot of people will either take too much time off, right? They sit around and talk to their buddies for five, six minutes and do the lift and it's heavy as fuck all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Or they don't take enough time off and they're lifting it too soon. So now when you have this window, you want to be at the end of the window on time, right? Because you're like, oh my God, I'm pretty tired from the row or the run or whatever. I'm going to wait. So they wind up waiting and they wind up without knowing it, resting just the right amount of time to do that lift. So for me, it's actually a really smart way of doing it because if you know if you knew exactly what you were doing every single day, you probably wouldn't be coming into a classroom setting, right? You're probably there because you want some guidance. So I'm trying to figure out the best way to guide people. And when people find my programming, they realize that 
I'm really doing it in such a way that I'm maximizing the amount of time they're there. I'm maximizing their strength gains, their results, all these different things off of just stealing a whole bunch of ideologies and just making them one. It's very different to CrossFit when you think about CrossFit, especially traditional sort of CrossFit stuff. Like it's very different. Well, I'll do high intensity interval bodybuilding days, like the stuff that I write in my eBooks. I'll do days of that stuff um, in the middle of a week. That's like very CrossFit-y. And then I'll just have like one day where we kind of do a bodybuilding circuit, but it's in a conditioning format. Mm -hmm. And not everybody loves it for sure. Like they're there to do strict CrossFit, but not everyone's getting hurt all the time. You know, like I have a very, very low rate of people getting injuries. And it's because we spend time doing like isolated movements on certain muscle groups and letting those muscles get stronger so that when you're doing a dynamic portion of that lift at some point with those muscle groups, they're not going to get hurt. There's not like me, people. but my, my torn bicep, like yeah. that's probably overuse from a lot of years of doing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of muscle ups and thousands of snatches and, you know, just a ton of different things. There's not a whole lot of people now that I know who absolutely love CrossFit, you know, so the gym that I train at has 800 members. You would absolutely love it, man. It's like a playground for fitness. Like, uh, wow. 800? 800 members. Yeah. Reebok CrossFit Tyneside in the north of England. It is Alico certified, Alico weights placed in bars, calibrated, the comp plates, the weightlifting plates, the powerlifting little steel plates, all the bumpers, it's- like a 60, 70 foot rig in two rooms. It's, it's just, it's beautiful. Um, we is got there that, an open gym? Yep. Is there an open gym? 6 a.m. until 9 p.m. every day except for weekends. And you can always open gym. There's always open gym. Some of the classes, class size tops out about 40, 40 people. Um, and yeah, Jordan, interestingly, the guy who owns that, he went through like, I'm going to get this wrong. He's going to kill me. But I think he went through like seven sites before this one. So he was the first version of the gym owner that you described the start in a studio move up to a slightly bigger studio then a garage then under an arch then a industrial unit slightly bigger industrial unit and now he's got something underneath a, a carpet shop the whole basement underneath a carpet shop and there's a full bodybuilding side to it there's a full weightlift inside and oh man, that's so cool it's legit i'll send you some i'll send you some videos on email once i'm done it's it's beautiful right um but with that even I see now in those classes, I think the removal of regionals has, has played quite a lot into this, um, but people aren't in love with CrossFit. I think they're in love with the sweat. They're in love with the community. They're in love with a lot of the things that CrossFit really brought together and created as a community. But you know, those, you're know, you right, the, the overhead squat workouts, the real high skill under load and fatigue workouts where you know even the best athletes the most robust athletes that are in the gym know i'm i'm probably dicing with death a little bit here with regards to maybe where my shoulder position is or maybe where my lower back feels at the moment or where, maybe how my knee feels at the moment or something you know people doing like deadlifts running like heavy deadlifts like coupled with running coupled with box jumps stuff like that you're like fuck man like you know there's something risky going on here a little bit and i wonder how much you can sacrifice on that pure crossfit side you know the golden era 2009 2010 programming crossfit sacrifice on that and then get back in terms of safety get back in terms of you know the hypertrophy um response which is whatever anyone who says that they do crossfit and don't want to be in unbelievable condition is lying to themselves and lying to the people they're talking to yeah i can't stand that shit they're like i just i just really want to feel good and you know whatever and i'm like you're telling me that you don't want to look better there's no fucking way you know what i mean like there's just no way like everybody wants to look good you know what i mean and I think that, I think that's a, that's a big reason people like my programming too, is because I do some of that bodybuilding stuff in there. I am all about people looking good, right? Like when you say my name, you say my gym, I want you to look good. So that is a thing that I definitely concentrate on. And I don't think it takes an exercise physiologist or an athlete who's been competing for 10 years to look at a CrossFit workout and say, that's fucking dumb. Like, why am I going to do 21, 15, nine of overhead squats and something else as fast as I probably can. Like an overhead squat is absolutely 100% meant to be like concentrated on, like making sure you're in the right position, making sure you're not just, just doing something. You know what I mean? Like even snatches, like when in the world have we ever done 30 snatches for time? Like in history, it's always been like 
You never see a weightlifter do more than five, maybe at most. And even those guys, when they get older, they're fucking limping around and they're all fucked up. And we're doing 30, sometimes a hundred in a workout, right? Like if it's lighter, I'm saying 30 as in terms of like Isabel, like Isabel is a workout, Mm -hmm. but it's a lot of impact on your joints and your cartilage and all the stuff on your body. And I know that CrossFit this year really wanted to make it, they wanted to get back to old school style and really like come back to the roots of like why Greg Glassman originally started it. And then they fucking throw pistols in the open. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Because that's another movement that should be done like slowly and methodically, not like fast. And like, yeah, you can do it slow and methodically, but you're going to get last place. So well, look at regionals. Are... Look at regionals when, when everyone's chests, everyone was popping a chest. Yeah. You know, that what was that 2018 or something like that? That was, my, la- that, that was my last regional I competed in. Okay. But you came out of it with a, with a chest still attached. Yep. Yeah, but no, a lot of people they, didn't. They, they say that everybody who tore was like potentially on steroids. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I passed. Again, I passed. <laughs> that's, the, that's the litmus test. Uh, you guys never believed me. Yeah, I know. Until now when I've still got my pectoral attached. Yeah, interestingly, there was a, a couple of powerlifters I'm friends with, and they said that a pec tear is like a root one identifier of someone who is on peds, um, especially when they, so they're going into the squat bench deadlift, right? Um but yeah, you, you, you're totally right. Like there is some stuff and I just think that's dumb. Like it just doesn't really work. I was talking to Dr. Stuart McGill, back mechanic. So good friend of mine. I went and stayed with him in Canada last year. And um, I was talking to him and he said he once saw a CrossFit athlete who had nine bulging discs. I think the total number of vertebral bodies that you have is 17. So it's like more than half of the gaps between and that includes like all the the shit that's right up here right in the back of your neck like more than 50 percent of and he this was just compounded over time and you think what the what the fuck is going on here dude i remember one of my first probably my third or fourth regional event we had to do a three rep max overhead squat off the ground (laughs) do you remember that yeah yeah it was the first overhead squat in history that we ever had to do but we also didn't have a rack. So we had to clean it, throw it on our back, then pop it up. Dude, people were getting so fucked up trying to throw it on their back. I'm like, and have, have you ever done so many handstand push-ups in your life? That was just like one example. Here's another one. Have you ever done, have you ever done so many handstand push-ups like in a workout? Let's say you did 100 where your neck is like fucked up. Yeah. Like I don't think we should do kipping handstand push-ups ever. And then I also don't think that we should be doing, I don't even think we should be doing handstand pushups to be honest. Like there's presses, I think are such a great movement and there's no need. I mean, I think if you're doing strict handstand pushups and you're doing them correctly, I think they're okay. Mm. But most of the time it's for time. So like, even if it's strict, <clears throat> you're, you're going to fucking hit. Yeah. And it's like, why are we doing this? I don't understand. Like I've I walked away from this so workout many... half an inch shorter than when I walked into it. I mean, how cool would it be if the CrossFit games was just like, a one mile run for time, you know, like a 400 meter sprint, like all the max lifts, like, and, and, a, and a few conditioning workouts that had a whole bunch of, you know, pull-ups and toes of bar and shit in that. And like maybe a swim and like a bike and stuff like that. But like general events, like what's wrong with that? There's really nothing wrong. Like I know, and, and you can, you can vary them a little bit. Like maybe one year it's a 5k run and the other year it's a mile and the other year it's like an 800 meter sprint or whatever like basic track events and then, you know, basic lifting, some power lifting, some, a little bit of gymnastics work. That's not like devastating to your body. Like there's a, there's a better way to do it. Is that a sufficient, a thousand ex- percent. is that a sufficiently exciting spectacle for the, for the people that are there to watch? Do you think it can be dude, if you had all your favorite CrossFit athletes doing a 400 meter sprint for time, I would love to watch that. That would be fun. That would be fun. Or like a 2k, like a 2k, uh, row. Yeah. 2k row or a mile run. Um, and a fuck a 500 meter row would be amazing to watch just cause like people the tenths skidding, of a second, skidding the concept twos be, all over the place. They would be dying. Or you've seen like the, in, the indoor, indoor cycling where they go around the circle, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like you get, get everybody like that would be fucking rad. Fully gassed. Yeah. Yeah. It, it'd be awesome. I, I wonder how much sort of CrossFit set its stall out because it has been going so long and there is this sense, right? That you got to do more better, different, harder, faster, stronger, all this shit each year. Um, I wonder if there is a, a risk there of things getting too intense, Thing this constant requirement to 
one up the year before. You know, this year we're going to let the audience get involved. This year we're going to get an octopus to pick the balls out of the thing and he's going to tell us what the workout's going to be. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, it, it's, it's hard for me because I always feel like the last like two or three years, I'm like, man, CrossFit's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Like, I feel like the, the excitement level of someone to do CrossFit in my gym is getting less and mm. the people just want to come in and do this like crazy workout kind of is getting less and less. And I keep thinking that CrossFit's getting less, but there's still just as many people who want to go watch the CrossFit games and buy all the CrossFit shit online we're just not seeing them every day. It, but I, 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 I keep thinking at this rate, I'm like, they have to stop all of this. Like CrossFit games has to stop. They have to be spending an enormous amount of money for the games and all these things where it's, it's not a lucrative scenario for them anymore. And I keep thinking it's going to happen and it hasn't happened yet. Keeps but. on ticking over. The machine keeps on moving, man. It's interesting because you've got CrossFit as a sport, competitive sport, and you've got CrossFit as a training methodology, right? And there's nothing else. No one says, I'm training UFC. They say, like, I'm training... Well, the people that don't know what they're doing might say that. But they say, I'm training MMA. You know? like I, I think that it's the fact that you have... CrossFit as a competitive sport is one thing. But the more GPP kind of foundations of why Glassman created CrossFit is something else. And you're totally right. Anyone who follows... Is it at CrossFit Health, I think? Um, if you follow that on Instagram, it's like they've got models of a, an old lady's front room and some, uh, 60 year old guy bending over with a two gallon milk jug, like doing bent over rows with a two gallon milk jug because it's, they're setting their stall out. It's like, look, we're getting back to GPP. We're getting back to the fact that this just makes you better at life. Fitness for life, not life for fitness. And it's, it's interesting, man. I wonder, I wonder where it's going to go. Look, Ryan, I, I could, honestly, man, I could go on for, I could keep, I could dig back into this. Uh, if you've got time, I'd love to get you back on at some point soon. I want to delve into a million other things, but we've yeah, done, 100%. we've done an hour and a half, man. And it's like, I know, yeah, it goes you're going to have fast. to go to work. <laughs> no such thing as me going to work. I just start working. Oh yeah. I, well, this is part of work, right? Look, um, where can people go? They want to check out some of your, your, um, ebooks and, and your platforms and stuff where should they go they can probably find everything on my instagram which is ryan fish r-y-a-n-f-i-s-c-h and i have a, one of those little link trees in my bio where it has the connection to pretty much everything or if you want to follow just strict strictly the gym stuff it's just crossfit chalk on instagram we have crossfit chalk.com and then my personal website is jim ryan.com which is g-y-m-r-y-a-n see what i did there nice. kind of took the jim jones jim kind of jones. deal yeah but then also like Everything for me started with a gym, so it has some I has some secret Ryan. underlying. Yeah, yeah, I get yeah. It. it's kind of cool. Yeah, so man, it's been it's been absolutely awesome. Thanks so much for your time. <clears throat> no problem. We'll see Love you again it. soon. Yes, sir.